Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime video. When we left off in part one of this case, everyone in the Lakeland area of Florida was starting to get suspicious about how newly wealthy resident Abraham Shakespeare seemed to have completely vanished and the only person who knew anything about where he had gone was a woman he'd just met less than a year prior. So if you have not seen part one yet, please go over and watch part one before you watch this part because part one comes before part two and the link will be in the description box. Before we dive right into what is going to be a very long video, I'd like to have a word from the sponsor of today's video, June's Journey. June's Journey is a hidden object mystery game set in one of my favorite eras, the 1920s. Here on this channel, we love a good mystery, a good detective story, but we also like to relax and unwind after a long day. June's Journey gives you the best of both worlds. Whenever I want to unplug from the real world, which let's be honest, kind of sucks right now, but still exercise my brain and use critical thinking, I pull up June's Journey on my phone or tablet and play. It's a vintage murder mystery where you are responsible for being a detective and finding hidden objects in hundreds of beautifully colored and carefully painted scenes. It's challenging in a way where you're still using your brain and putting your observational skills to the test, but it's also allowing you to relax and enjoy a few minutes of peace, which right now is priceless. Each new scene takes you further through a thrilling murder mystery story set in the 1920s that puts the main protagonist, June Parker, on a quest to solve the murder of her sister and uncover her family's many secrets, and June gets herself into some trouble and some sticky situations on the way. I love June's Journey. They've sponsored this channel before, and I know a lot of you have already downloaded it and you love it as well. It's completely free to download on your mobile phone or tablet, either Android or iOS, and you can also play on your desktop through Amazon and Facebook. I like that this game has that true crime vibe, but it's also wholesome enough where I can play with my kids who get a kick out of competing with me to see who can find the object first. We really get into it. We are excited. We're shouting at each other. You know, Aiden's always trying to grab the tablet away from me so that I don't find the object because he's a cheater. And I love how you go into playing this game at first thinking it's going to be easy, but it's really not. It's very challenging but incredibly exciting and fun to play. There's so much happening around us. Most of us spend our days scrolling through the news, feeling the stress of the world on our shoulders. I know personally that after researching horrible crimes throughout the day, June's journey is a welcome escape from reality where I don't feel like I'm wasting my time or being unproductive because I'm giving my brain a little workout as well. We are all here because we love a great mystery and trying to solve it. So if you're interested in downloading June's Journey, the link is in the description box. As always, supporting the sponsors of this channel supports the channel and allows me to keep bringing you content. And as always, I would never endorse a company or a sponsor that I didn't use myself and completely believe in it and support because I respect you guys more than that. So check out the description box for the link if you're interested in trying out June's Journey and downloading it for free. Thank you to June's Journey for sponsoring this video and thanks to all of you who continue to come back and watch these videos. I love you and I appreciate you. Let's get on to the video. Besides Dee Dee Moore, there was two other people who had been close to Abraham and who were working overtime to dispel the rumors that anything nefarious had happened to him. Judy Haggins, a woman that Abraham had grown up partying with who now had his power of attorney, and Cedric Edom, Abraham's cousin. Over the summer of 2009, some relatives had begun putting pressure on Abraham's mother, Elizabeth Parker, to file a missing persons report on her son, who no one had seen in months. Cedric continually told Elizabeth that this was a waste of time since Abraham had gone away and wanted to stay gone for the time being. Cedric also told Miss Parker that he'd talked to her son almost every day and that Abraham was planning to come back home by Thanksgiving, which was his favorite holiday. Cedric even hand delivered a birthday card from Abraham to Elizabeth, Abraham's mother, in August of 2009 with a note handwritten allegedly from Abraham saying that he'd be home soon. The card also included a $100 check and a cross pendant. So when people came knocking at Elizabeth's door suggesting that she go to the police to report her son was missing, she pretty much showed them the card and waved them away. 
But by November, when Abraham still had not made an appearance, a woman named E.C. Black stepped in. She was like a second mother to Abraham, and she had done his taxes for him every year, but this year, he hadn't so much as reached out to tell her that he wouldn't require her services. She went to the police department herself to file a missing persons report, but she was told she needed to be family in order to do so. So she called Abraham's cousin, Cedric, and she asked him to do it since he was a blood relative. Cedric did go down to the Polk County Sheriff's Office and he met with a Major Joe Hellman on November 9th, 2009. He told this police officer that he believed his cousin might be in danger, since a few months ago he'd been paid $5,000 to give Abraham's mother a card and to lead her to believe that he'd been in contact with Abraham but he really hadn't been. Cedric claimed that at the time money had been tight and he'd felt his little task would actually help Elizabeth worry less about her son because at that time he believed that Abraham had actually left on his own, but now he was starting to feel differently. When the police asked who had paid him the money to deliver the card, Cedric had no problem revealing the name of Dee Dee Moore. It also probably didn't hurt that since their business arrangement had ended and been complete, Dee Dee's company had been threatening to repossess Cedric's car and his house since she held the loans on both of them, so maybe he was feeling a little vengeful. The next day, the case was handed over to Detective Chad McConkie, who immediately realized this was no ordinary case, so he called Dee Dee Moore to come in for an interview, which she easily agreed to because Dee Dee loves to talk. Dee Dee loves to tell stories. Dee Dee loves to hear the sound of her own voice. Dee Dee Moore sat in an interrogation room with Detective McConkie and another detective named Chris Lynn, who had already done a brief investigation into Abraham's financials, only to discover that by the time he'd met Dee Dee, most of his money had been spent, leaving him with only a few million. But Detective Lynn had seen people kill for a lot less. Dee Dee was a fountain of information, cooperating almost too much with the police officers. Like I said, this woman loved to talk, loved to hear herself talk, I guess, and supposedly she was under the false assumption that a good life should be complicated and convoluted. She told them that she had planned on writing a book about Abraham, but when she met him, she realized that he was a real person who was going through something tough. And since she was so giving and kind-natured, it was her initial impulse to just help him. She claimed Abraham had been planning on leaving town to get away from all the people who wanted money from him. Even before he'd met her, he'd been planning on doing that, and he'd even procured a fake passport under the name Rodriguez so he could travel anonymously. The detectives made a plan with Dee Dee to meet her later in the day at Abraham's home, which had become her home, and once there, Dee Dee explained that she'd bought the house from Abraham before he left for $655,000 in cash. The only problem was Dee Dee had no proof of this transaction. She couldn't show the receipts. And when she couldn't produce this evidence, she changed her story, claiming that no, she hadn't given him money for his house. She had compensated him for the house by paying for his travels around the world in return for the house. At this point, Dee Dee knew she was in some trouble. She'd evaded suspicion for the better part of a year, but now the police were asking questions that she didn't have valid answers for. So she started bribing people to help her support her story, or stories in her case, because she had so many stories. A week after her meeting with the police, Dee Dee went to Abraham's ex-girlfriend, Centoria Butler, under the false pretense of checking in to make sure that Centoria and her son were financially doing okay. After catching Abraham red-handed with other women too many times, a pregnant Centoria had moved out right before giving birth to their son, Jeremiah. Abraham hadn't been paying child support to Centoria since he'd vanished, so Dee Dee came with a peace offering of a new car and a new house if Centoria would just help Abraham out and tell the police that she'd seen him recently. Centoria agreed, but as soon as Dee Dee left, she picked up the phone and called the police, letting them know that this woman had just tried to bribe her into filing a false report. When that plan didn't work, Dee Dee turned to Greg Smith. She picked him up at the barber shop and took him for a ride again. While she was driving, she told him that she needed a very small favor from him, but he had to promise to not tell anyone, even Judy, who Dee Dee had come to distrust. She dropped him back off at the barbershop, instructing Greg to meet her later at the local shopping mall parking lot. It's like, why couldn't you have just asked him 
for the favor while you were in the car. What's with all the cloak and dagger routines? Who are you, Tony Soprano? She picks him up, asks him to take a ride with her, and then she's like, I need a favor from you. And he's like, what? And she's like, meet me later, I'll tell you. Seems like a really unproductive waste of time. Anyways, a few hours later, Greg pulled into the parking lot and he looked around for Dee Dee's gray Hummer, but he didn't see it. So he called her to see what was holding her up and she told him to find the white Chevy F-250 and park next to it. So you're thinking, did Dee Dee get herself another new car? Technically, she did buy another new vehicle, but it wasn't in her name, it was in her young boyfriend's name. Could it be that she just liked to spend money or maybe she felt she was being followed by law enforcement so she needed to throw them off by driving a different vehicle? Who can tell and who wants to get into this woman's mind anyways, honestly. So they're in this parking lot, Greg pulls up next to this white truck and she motions for him to get into her truck. And as soon as he gets inside, she basically unloads on him, right? She tells Greg, I'm so stressed out, this is crazy, the police are looking into me in regards to Abraham's disappearance. Can you believe it? That's crazy. Now, Dee Dee knew very well that it was much more than that. After meeting with the original detectives, she'd been interviewed by another police officer, homicide detective Dave Wallace. And Wallace was not holding any punches back when he talked to her. The other cops already knew Dee Dee was lying and her constant antics had been driving them crazy. So when Dave Wallace sat down in front of her and Dee Dee started doing her you know, song and dance about how she was just this good person who'd been trying to help Abraham, Wallace looked at her and said, quote, you know what I think, Dee Dee? I think Abraham Shakespeare's dead and I think you know he's dead, end quote. Dee Dee Moore didn't even blink. She didn't look shocked. She just started crying and she told Wallace and the other detectives that, That wasn't true. She didn't kill Abraham. She couldn't help them. She didn't know anything more than she'd already told them. But she did, however, know that Abraham's mother had gotten a card from him where he promised he'd be home for Thanksgiving. So maybe they should just wait it out and see what happened. And these cops who already know that Dee Dee paid Cedric to deliver that card to Abraham's mother, they know she's full of it. But technically, legally, there's nothing they can do at this point because she hasn't confessed anything and they don't have any hard evidence. So Thanksgiving, Abraham's favorite holiday, it comes, it goes, and Dee Dee has to come in and meet with the detectives again. And at this point, they were a little bit more ready for her. They had already gotten a search warrant to go through, not her house, but Abraham's house on Red Hawk Bend Boulevard. And they'd already gotten search warrants to go through Dee Dee's computers. So when Dee Dee sat down in front of them in this interrogation room again, they demanded to know where Abraham was. And Dee Dee once again broke into tears and started peppering them with a whole bunch of different stories. Abraham was pretending to be in HIV treatment so no one would go looking for him. But in reality, he was laying low because there was a videotape out there of Abraham having sex with an underage girl. And he was afraid that he'd be put behind bars for a long time if it ever came to light. Do I think that you're a cold-blooded killer? No, I I hope you're not a cold-blooded killer. I have not killed him. I hope he's not even dead. He's not. He wanted to pretend that he was dying of AIDS so that he doesn't have to pay child support and people won't look for him if he's dying of AIDS. My family's being affected. My mom's got heart problems. She's over my house right now cleaning for Thanksgiving. They were, my own parents were scared to come to my house for Thanksgiving. Why? Because of all this stuff happening. Well, how do they know about all this stuff? Because I'm, I'm honest with my family. It was a videotape of him having sex with a 14-year-old girl. Dave Wallace looked at her in disgust and said, quote, I honestly can't look at you and believe a word that's coming out of your mouth. End quote. I honestly can't look at you and believe a word that's come out of your mouth. Have you have no- lied and lied and lied. I- Dee Dee Moore was not deterred, however, because before she left, she turned to another police officer in the room, a Detective Clark, who had been playing the good cop role to Dave Wallace's bad cop, and Dee Dee suggested that she and and Detective Clark get a hotel room together so they could have a good time. One detective told the jury Moore even made a pass at him after the interrogation. She actually came toward me and she said that I wasn't going to get angry, that I was going to have sex with her. She said she was very attracted to me and hoped once her name was clear that I would pursue a relationship with her. 
And this is actually a little sad to me because I, I don't feel any sympathy for Dee Dee Moore. You know me. I'm an unsympathetic person when it comes to criminals. People talk about it all the time, how mean I am to horrible criminals that hurt other people. I'm such a monster. But in this situation, I can tell with Dee Dee and her interactions with other people, especially males, that when somebody is the least bit nice to her, when somebody acts like they want to help her, she almost kind of attaches onto them. And I personally do not think that it's all a manipulation technique because Dee Dee manipulates everybody, whether they're being nice to her, whether they're being mean to her. But when somebody's nice to her, it's almost as if she feels, oh, I have an ally here and I have to give them whatever I can to keep them an ally to me, whether that's money or sex. So when Dee Dee met with Greg in that mall parking lot, she was already under a lot of heat from the police. And it wasn't just because they thought Abraham was missing and she knew where he was. It was because they thought Abraham was dead and they thought Dee Dee was probably responsible for it. Dee Dee told Greg, I'm under all the scrutiny for nothing. Abraham's fine. He just doesn't want to come back right now and I can't make him come back. I wish I could because then all of this would go away and my life would be back to normal. She told Greg that she just needed to get the police off her back for a little while until Abraham could come home and explain everything and exonerate her. So she offered to pay Greg $300 to place an anonymous call to Detective Dave Wallace, who she did not tell Greg was a Detective Dave Wallace. She just told him to call this guy, Dave Wallace, and didn't tell Greg that he was calling and making an illegal false report to a police detective. But once Greg got Dave Wallace on the phone, he was supposed to say that he'd seen Abraham at a strip club in Miami. And if this Wallace guy asked Greg how he knew that it was Abraham he'd seen, Greg was to tell Wallace that this this guy Abraham's identification had dropped out of his pocket and he saw it and that's how he knew that it was Abraham which is a very far-fetched story if you think about it because strip clubs are notoriously dim lit so if somebody's identification fell out of their pocket unless you're like getting down on the floor and, and looking at it you're probably not gonna get a good idea of who who's on that identification but okay so Greg agreed to do this thinking that he was just calling some random guy off the street who he was trying to help get off of Dee Dee's back. And in turn, hopefully this would get Dee Dee off of Greg's back. So he went to a gas station a few blocks away to use the payphone and place that call. Now Greg said what he was supposed to say and when Wallace started asking questions, Greg hung up and went to go collect his money from Dee Dee who was full of questions on how the call had gone. This whole thing happened in December. But the favors that Dee Dee would want from Greg were not over. Two weeks later, she called him again. She wanted him to make another phone call. But this time, it wasn't to a stranger. It was to Abraham's mother, Elizabeth Parker. The plan was for Dee Dee to take Miss Parker out to dinner at a Cracker Barrel where it was loud and she'd be distracted. Once they'd sat down to eat, Dee Dee was going to text Greg the letter C, which would be his signal to place a call to the prepaid cell phone that Dee Dee had given Elizabeth Parker. Once Abraham's mother was on the phone, Greg would pretend to be Abraham and tell his mother that he was okay, but he couldn't come home just yet because the police were looking for him after he'd choked a girl in a club. Dee Dee said, that this call would give Abraham's mother some peace of mind so that she wasn't worried about her son because every mother feels incredibly relieved when she hears that her child is being chased by the police after assaulting a woman in a club. Greg did not feel good about this plan because he felt things were going a little too far. But against his better impulses, he did call Elizabeth Parker at 6 p.m. on December 27, 2009. The next day, Dee Dee and Greg met in another parking lot and Dee Dee's disposition was much improved from their past meeting. She was cheerful and she told Greg that Miss Parker had bought it. The thing was, Miss Parker had not bought it, not even a little bit. She called the police and said someone had called her pretending to be Abraham, but she knew her son's voice and this person on the phone was not him. First, she allegedly tried to convince Shakespeare's mother, Elizabeth Walker, that her son was still alive, just missing, orchestrating a phone call with someone claiming to be her son. He said, it's Abraham. And I said, well, you don't sound like Abraham. It just so happened that when she got the call, she was having a nice dinner at the Cracker Barrel with Dee Dee Moore, which obviously added to law enforcement's suspicion that Dee Dee was pulling a fast one. So they decided to trace the call that Elizabeth had received, the one Greg was supposed to have made from a payphone, but he had decided to use his personal cell phone for. 
Once they knew that he had made the call, they began to follow him, and that's when they saw Greg meet with Dee Dee in the parking lot and accept a wad of cash from her before driving away. Now, as Greg drove away from his meeting with Dee Dee, he stopped at a red light to reflect on the craziness of the last few months. He truly did not think anything bad had happened to Abraham. He even suspected that Abraham was avoiding people, and the person that he was avoiding the most was probably Dee Dee Moore herself. But he still didn't feel right about calling Miss Parker and lying to her. As he was considering all of this, his Toyota Camry was surrounded by three police officers while he was still stopped at that red light. They took him into custody, and they began to question him about what his relationship was with Dee Dee Moore. Greg admitted to having made the phone calls at her request, but he was honest when he said that he didn't know where his old friend Abraham was. The police told him that they suspected Dee Dee did know, and they wanted him to help them find out. If Greg chose to help them, his goal would be to get Dee Dee to trust him and then get information out of her about where Abraham Shakespeare actually was. Greg had learned that a man who helps the police wasn't always looked too kindly on in the streets, so he told the detectives that he needed some time to think about it. When Greg got home, he called Judy Haggins, who had told him, remember, that she'd seen Abraham in Texas. Greg asked Judy, what's going on? Why are the cops saying that something's happened to Abraham when you've been telling everyone that you've not only talked to him several times, but you've actually seen him? Now, at this point, Judy essentially admitted to Greg that Dee Dee had talked her into telling people that she'd seen Abraham, but she actually hadn't. Judy did, however, have some interesting information from one of the last times she'd actually seen Abraham. One day, Abraham was planning to go to the bank to check on his funds. And I guess Dee Dee found out that he was planning to go to the bank, so she called Judy, begging her to make sure Abraham did not go to the bank, distract him, keep him busy, whatever it takes, do not let him go to the bank. Later, Judy had felt bad about taking part in this, so she tried to convince Abraham to stand up to Dee Dee and take his money back, and he'd responded, quote, you know that white woman got my money. She can do anything to me, end quote. Judy confessed to Greg that she'd previously thought Abraham was okay and just hiding out, but now she was starting to get worried. After this call, Greg made his decision. Abraham was his friend, and he'd been a good friend. And this woman, Dee Dee, knew more than she was saying. He picked the phone back up and called Dave Wallace to let him know that he was in and he was ready to take Dee Dee Moore down. While the police and Greg Smith were preparing their sting operation, Dee Dee was calling the Polk County Sheriff's Office almost every day to just tell them random things, right? Random things. Things she remembered that might help them find Abraham, such as that he'd developed a drug problem and he'd been hanging out with some unsavory characters that might have meant to do him harm. She quickly realized the police weren't buying what she was selling, so she turned to the local media, giving them the video that she'd made of Abraham where he said he wanted to go away to anywhere, that he wasn't picky, he just wanted to get away. Dee Dee told a reporter from the ledger that Abraham had planned on running and not coming back. He had intentionally not wanted to be found, and in order to achieve this, he would do whatever it took. She said, quote, I want these idiots, these drug heads and these coke heads to know that I've sold everything. Abraham sold me his mess to get a better life, and I practically gave it all away to get mine back, end quote. The officers in Polk County shook their heads when they read the article, and Dave Wallace said, the more Dee Dee talks, the guiltier she looks. She thinks she's smarter than everyone else. In January, the plan to get Dee Dee Moore to reveal information started. The police put a small wire on Greg Smith's chest under his clothes, and he was obviously nervous about the whole thing, wearing a wire and having to go alone and talk to Dee Dee while wearing this wire. The detectives convinced him that they would be very close and listening to everything. If things went south, they'd be on Dee Dee within seconds. Greg drove to the parking lot of a Denny's in Plant City, Florida, and when Dee Dee pulled up, he waved his hand at her, telling her to get into his car this time because hers might be bugged. It was Greg's plan to convince Dee Dee that he was on her side, that he could become her confidant and maybe even her partner. And in order to do this, he had to be really nice to her, placate her, and tell her that everyone else was crazy for even suspecting she was involved in whatever had happened to Abraham. Boy, I never know about you anyway. I never give you up. You know what I'm saying? That, Ever. Man, this, I'm so deep in this shit with you right now. If you go down, I go down right now. The hope was that, in the same way that she had warmed to Detective David Clark, who was playing good cop, she would latch onto Greg 
And she did latch on, literally. Within minutes of being in the car, Dee Dee launched herself onto Greg and started groping him. Now, I'm not sure if she was putting the moves on him. I mean, he's a handsome guy, a smooth talker. Or if she was trying to see if he was wearing a wire. But Greg thought she was looking for a wire, so he pushed her off and yelled at her to get out of the car. She tried to apologize for her forwardness, but Greg wasn't taking any chances. He lectured her that it wasn't right to just get into somebody's car and start grabbing them and be all over them. So she began to cry, which was her old standby whenever she wanted people, men especially, to feel bad for her. Once they had both regained their composure, Greg got back on script, reassuring Dee Dee that he would help her straighten this whole mess out, telling her, I'm here for you, baby. You just have to stay calm and do what you gotta do. We're in this together. Obviously, Greg wanted to keep helping the police, but he wanted to avoid another close call. So this is when he came up with a brilliant plan. It was well known by everybody that Greg loved Red Bull. He was always sipping on a can of it. He always had one with him, near him, in his hand, on his desk. So he figured out a way to take a Red Bull can apart so that he could essentially make a false bottom in the can where a little recording device could be placed. He proudly brought his innovation to the police station where the impressed detectives all got very excited and gave him high fives. I didn't want to tell him at the time, but I'm thinking, damn, that's a good idea. <laughs> you know, I wish I had thought about this back when I was in narcotics. They were all excited for their first chance to use Greg's invention, which would come only a few days later. On January 20th, when Dee Dee called Greg and asked him to meet her in the parking lot of the North Lakeland Target. Greg hung up the phone, called Dave Wallace, and let him know it was Thundercats or go time. Because whenever Greg goes to meet Dee Dee, the police have to know so that they can go and be nearby and listen to the wire and make sure that Dee Dee's not murdering Greg. When Dee Dee got in his car, she told Greg that she'd just heard from Judy that Judy's phone was being tapped. So she needed Greg to go inside the Target and buy two prepaid phones to replace the ones that were allegedly being monitored by the police. But before Greg goes into Target, this lady, Dee Dee Moore, starts uh, essentially telling Greg about this drug dealer named Ronald that Greg knows about. And Greg's sitting here next to her thinking, I've never heard of a guy named Ronald before in my life. What's this woman talking about? I'm like, well, who Ronald? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Who, who is Ronald? Well, Ronald is the guy, the drug dealer from Miami that saw Shakespeare. I'm Ronald. Ronald's imaginary. But Greg eventually figured out that Dee Dee was trying to signal to him without saying it outright that if the police ever caught up with him, connected him to her and to Abraham, that he should just blame everything on this Ronald fellow who was clearly a figment of Dee Dee's imagination that she had just invented right then and there. But what's important about this is the police have on tape Dee Dee making up a person named Ronald who doesn't exist and already kind of premeditating her defense should she ever get caught. But wait, there's more. When Greg got back into the car after buying these two phones, Dee Dee told him that she needed to write a letter from Abraham to his mother telling her that he was all right so that Elizabeth would bring it to the police and the police would stop harassing Dee Dee. The only problem was she needed someplace quiet and private to write this letter. So she instructed Greg to go and rent a hotel room under the names Mark and Mary Weeks. He should get two keys. He should drop one of the keys off to her and keep the other for himself and then meet her at the hotel later that evening so that she could write the letter and then they could both deliver it to Elizabeth Parker. Um, Greg did all of this. And then when he showed up at the Comfort Inn at around 6 p.m. that night, he opened the door to find Dee Dee looking like Dexter in his kill room. She was wearing head-to-toe protective gear. Gloves, shoe covers, a hairnet, a medical mask, the little suit that crime scene techs wear. I can't even imagine what Greg Smith was thinking when he opened the door and saw this lady decked out like this. It's just so ridiculous. Well, I do know what he thought when he saw her because he talked about it later. He thought, this lady is going to murder me. But then Dee Dee handed him gloves and shoe covers to wear as well, telling him that she didn't want their DNA left at the hotel. She was like, come in, come in. She's like, listen, put your gloves on. I said, put my gloves on. She's like, I don't want none of your hair to get stuck in the computer or like this forensic file type of thing. I'm like, man, this lady is off her rockers. And then when he's inside and the door to the hotel room is closed, Dee Dee pulls a whole ass laptop out from under the bed, still in the box, just purchased, as well as a whole ass brand new printer. 
Dee Dee began to write the letter on this new laptop connected to this new printer, and she would stop every so often to have Greg read it and ask him if he thought it sounded like something Abraham would say. You know, um, you were just like everyone else trying to talk me out of staying away. I'm not out of my mind, should I put it that way? Yeah, and not out of my mind, kind of. I'm not, I'm not a child, and I'm not out of my mind. I think that's convincing. I think that's going to take a lot of you off from that. Here is what the letter said. Dear Mom, I like being missing, just not all over the news. I've been through a lot, Mom. You know it. I'm just tired. Over where I stayed, no one knows me, and there are so many out-of-towners, you never run into the same people twice, except the police. I got a new one that Dee Dee will like for her book. The officer that's around my neighborhood kept bugging me and teasing me. I look like Abraham Shakespeare. I showed him my fake ID and it worked until last week when he caught me speeding. I was so scared so I told him the truth. He never ran my driver's license. I just explained all that I'd been through and admitted to him who I was. He followed me home and I paid him 20 grand to keep his mouth shut. He's gonna look out for me now. He said, anybody doubt who you are, just call me. Dee's mad because I won't come back, but I can't right now. I see where it's been hard on her 15-year-old son. Tell RJ, her son, I will buy him a car and send him money in the mail for what I put his mom through. I don't want him mad at me when I come back. I told Tori, she's not getting a damn dime. Dee tell people she won't go to jail for me on child support. I like my new life too much to sit in a jail 179 days. I guess tell Judy to go to court and find out how much that bitch gonna cost me. Tori said I had stink-ass breath and acted like she only slept with me for the money and got pregnant on purpose. The court won't even let me get a DNA test when she told that guy it is not even my baby. I'm so upset to talk to you, Mom. I almost killed that girl, and if I come back, I think she will try to put me in jail. If she truly did not press charges, she said someone needs to stop me. I need to get help, but I still want to hear from you with all that mess. Thanks for letting me talk the other day. Why did they say you have not talked to me since April? I called you two days after Christmas. No one forgets their son's voice. Why are you going this way? You know it was me. And if I don't have a warrant, they cannot force me to come see you. I will see you. I promise. Just give me some time. I'm trying to locate this girl and make sure she's not going to start some shit. I only called because Dee lied and put the word out that you were in the hospital with chest pains because of all this. I really don't feel like talking about all I did yet. When I get some help and work it out myself, I will come back and explain to you. I still can't write a letter. This good friend typing for me. I don't want everyone to know my business, so I can't say some things to you. You let me to be raised by my dad for years. You should understand more than anyone. I just need time. Don't worry about Dee. If she goes to jail, she'll be okay. The charges won't stick. There are too many people that know I left. I gave her enough money. She know what to expect. She should have not got involved, so now she just have to deal with it. She would not take anything from me unless I agreed to retire you. She was the only one who helped me when my money was messed up. Don't feel bad for what Dee going through. I gave her 10 times what she did for me. So that's the only portion of the letter I could find that was made public, but apparently there were four more pages where Dee Dee, writing as Abraham, claimed to not be out of his mind and not be a child. And then she also writes in this letter about this Ronald character she just invented, saying that Abraham wanted Ronald to stop by and pick up a framed picture of his lottery win. Then she printed this letter out using tweezers to remove the pages from the printer and using a sponge to wet the envelope so she wouldn't leave behind any fingerprints or DNA. This whole song and dance to simply write and print out one letter, hazmat suits, new laptops, a hotel room rented exclusively to write in privacy, all this care taken to not leave behind any DNA, it's kind of impressive actually. But it was pointless. Before Greg went to the motel that day, he'd already told the police what they were doing and the detectives were waiting outside. When Greg and Dee Dee left the motel, the police pulled out behind them and followed them to Elizabeth Parker's house. They watched Greg run to the mailbox and put the letter in before jumping back into the car and leaving. And within seconds, the police had also arrived at the mailbox and had taken the letter out and placed it in an evidence bag. Thankfully, Abraham's mother would not have to open her mailbox and get that horrible letter. She had suffered enough. She already suspected something happened to her son. Now she's supposed to read this letter where Abraham's like, you know, you left me to be raised by my dad. You should understand I need some time. I hope this girl doesn't press charges. Only Dee Dee's helped me. Dee Dee's a saint. Dee Dee wouldn't take any money from me unless I helped you with money. Like, unbelievable that, that Dee Dee Moore thought she would write this letter from Abraham and send it to his own mother, and that his own mother would read it and say, yeah, this sounds like my son. Now, Grady Judd has been the Polk County Sheriff since 2004, and he's gained a reputation for a no-nonsense, tell-it-like-it-is attitude when it comes to dealing with crime and criminals. On January 13th, 2010, he held a press conference to discuss the Abraham Shakespeare case, and he was pretty upfront on how he felt about it and how he felt about Dee Dee Moore. It appears, and I'm very cautious, 
that Abraham Shakespeare is broke. Two and a half years ago, a little less than three years ago, he had $12.7 million, and it appears that he's broke. The investigation's ongoing. We certainly hope that the Confidence Act that Dee Dee Moore is involved in to make it appear that Abraham Shakespeare has disappeared with money is correct and he's alive and well. But our investigation doesn't lead us to believe that at this time. It leads us to believe that she pulled a con game on Shakespeare, convinced him to move his assets into a joint account through an LLC that she named Abraham Shakespeare LLC but created access to, plus she agreed to buy the house and other assets from him for which we can't find any records of purchase. She made the statement to us, and she's agreed with this, that, oh, I paid him that 840000 in cash. I'm sure the IRS is going to be interested in that, and we're going to make sure that they know that she apparently had $840,000, according to her statement that she gave Abraham in cash. Quite frankly, we don't see where she had $840,000. Keep in mind that there is a $10,000 cash reward for information leading us to Abraham Shakespeare, dead or alive. That's $10,000 to find Abraham Shakespeare, dead or alive, and we don't ask anyone to testify or put themselves in that position. They can dial 1-800-226-TIPS, relay that information to us. We certainly hope Abraham's alive and well, and he has successfully hidden himself away. But none of the circumstances and none of the investigation we've completed up to this point leads us to believe he's still alive. The day before this press conference, Sheriff Grady had officially named Dee Dee a person of interest in Abraham's disappearance. And now with this press conference, where he had basically all but said he believed Abraham was not alive and well, and that Dee Dee was not being honest with the police, the whispers of foul play that had been flying around Lakeland transformed into calls for justice, and Dee Dee was beside herself. She could not understand why. The police were still so focused on her after she'd gone to all that trouble and written a letter to Abraham's mother. Grady hadn't even mentioned it at the press conference. She called Greg freaking out, and he was absolutely stunned and confused at how delusional Dee Dee seemed to be on the phone. Dee Dee was basically wondering to Greg why the police were still looking for Abraham after his mother had gotten a letter from him. Greg felt it was as if Dee Dee had truly begun to believe her own lies, that she truly believed the letter had been written by Abraham, even though she and Greg had written it in a hotel room dressed like astronauts. Then she started telling Greg about how she was being threatened by this Ronald, that he was leaving scary notes at her back door, that he was saying he was gonna hurt her and her family, and Greg was like, what are you talking about? You invented Ronald when I was in the car with you. I heard you make him up on the spot, but now you're telling me he's threatening you? So in my opinion, since this happened over the phone, Dee Dee most likely felt that her phone was being tapped and she was just trying to cover her tracks in case she was being recorded. So all of her lies that she had come up with, she was just cooperating them herself on this call in case the police were recording her calls. Some people believe that this phone call and other actions of Dee Dee Moore's were examples of her losing grip on reality, believing her own lies, becoming so incredibly delusional to the point of mental insanity. I disagree, I think she was just playing it safe. A few hours after that phone call, Greg and Dee Dee met up, and when she greeted him, she was as smiling and happy as a little girl on Christmas morning. She told him that someone had called her and told her that they'd seen Abraham that afternoon at a house in Walden Lake. So she had gone to the address, and she saw his car parked outside and a figure inside the car that looked like Abraham. She told Greg to get into the car quick. They were going to go over back to that house where Abraham's car had allegedly been earlier. They were going to confront him. But of course, when they got there, the car, the car was gone. The car was gone. Abraham left. Dee Dee turned to Greg and said, 
The effer's gone. I came by before and his car was there. He got away. As they drove away, Greg realized that it was just another story Dee Dee had made up to spread a rumor that Abraham was back, hoping to get the police off of her back. But this rumor didn't really catch on. And although Dee Dee spent hours watching the news and reading the papers, hoping someone would pick it up and print it, no one ever did. A few weeks later, she came crying again to Greg, saying the police were just trying to make her a fall guy and they would suppress any evidence that Abraham was still alive just to pin everything on her. And that's when Greg suggested that maybe Dee Dee needed her own fall guy. This was another plan that Greg and the detectives had come up with. Although Dee Dee had been spending a lot of time with Greg and talking to him nonstop, she had not yet admitted that Abraham was dead. She had just kept acting as if he was going to come home any day, so the detectives decided they needed to up the ante. The plan was for Greg to offer up a scapegoat to Dee Dee, someone who would admit to having killed Abraham so that the police could make their arrest and Dee Dee could go on with her life. That day, Greg told Dee Dee that he had a cousin who was facing a long prison sentence for another crime, and if the price was right, this cousin would tell the police that he was responsible for Abraham's death as well, since he was going to prison anyways. This was the first time Dee Dee's insistence that Abraham was okay wavered, and she told Greg that maybe he should give his cousin a call. Because Ronald kept telling her that Abraham was fine, but now she wasn't so sure that she believed him because Ronald wasn't letting her talk to Abraham. They chose an undercover police detective named Mike Smith, if that is his real name. And this Mike Smith would play the part of Greg's cousin, and they moved fast, setting the meeting between Mike Smith, Greg, and Dee Dee for two days later on January 21st, once again in a parking lot of the Lakeside Mall. I swear I will never look at two cars sitting next to each other in a parking lot the same again. I'm always going to think, like, is there some deal going down? Is there some, like, shady stuff happening? Is Dee Dee more in that car? Now, the night before this meeting, Greg had told Dee Dee that his cousin would do it, but he had a few conditions. One, he wanted money to be given to his family so they'd be taken care of while he was away. Two, he wanted Abraham's body so he could hide it. That way, Abraham wouldn't pop up later, proving that he'd lied to the police. Now, Dee Dee was hesitant about this. She didn't say that she didn't know where Abraham's body was. She just questioned why Abraham showing up alive at a later date would be a problem for Greg's cousin, because wouldn't that just get him off the hook for a murder charge? Greg's cousin could just say he'd killed another guy and he thought that it was Abraham. Greg was frustrated. This was going on way too long and she was not budging. So he insisted that his cousin would need something, something to prove that he had killed Abraham or the police would never believe him. On the day of the meeting, Greg and Dee Dee arrived early so they could go over the plan before the undercover agent posing as Greg's cousin arrived. As soon as Dee Dee got into Greg's car, she started talking about how she had an idea, an idea of some proof that they could give Greg's cousin. What if she could somehow get a hold of the gun that had killed Abraham? You know, the murder weapon. Wouldn't that be enough proof? Greg was momentarily stunned because it was the first time he'd heard anything about Abraham getting shot, but it was also the first time Dee Dee had strayed from her Abraham is fine story, so he quickly recovered and told her that was a great idea. To keep her talking, Greg suggested that his cousin could put his fingerprints on the gun and then bury it, so when he confessed to the murder, he could tell the cops where he'd hidden the murder weapon. And it wouldn't be connected to Dee Dee at all. But then Dee Dee was like, well, I mean, it might be because the gun's registered to me. Despite all the caution that she'd taken to hide her fingerprints and DNA from one little letter, apparently Dee Dee had killed Abraham with a gun that was registered to her. Greg had an answer for that too, though. They could just say that his cousin had broken into Abraham's house while Dee Dee and Abraham were inside. At that point, the cousin had held everyone at gunpoint while searching through the house for another gun, and then Abraham had pulled his own gun on this dude. This guy who's apparently talented enough to search an entire house for a gun that he doesn't know the location of while still holding two or more people at gunpoint at the same time. He can split himself in two or he's kind of like Gumby where he can really stretch very far. But when Abraham pulled out his gun, Greg's cousin had shot Abraham. And then he told Dee Dee that if she said anything to anyone, he would kill her and her whole family too the perfect airtight alibi. While they were talking about Abraham's fake murder, Dee Dee began to speculate about Abraham's real murder because she had completely at this point switched from Abraham is on vacation to yeah, he's probably dead. She said that it had probably been Ronald, the renegade drug dealer that she had told the police about dozens of times, but they didn't believe her. And the one time they'd actually gone to check it out and question Ronald, 
they had just told him that Dee Dee had implicated him, which had only made Ronald come at her even harder. Dee Dee even thought that Ronald had begun threatening Abraham's family and friends too. But even though this guy was a crazy drug dealer who had probably already killed one person, Dee Dee felt she could talk to him, reason with him, and get him to reveal the location where he buried Abraham's body. Maybe, just maybe, Ronald had killed Abraham on one of her properties and buried him there as well to frame her. But Dee Dee's gonna go and talk to Ronald. Dee Dee's gonna go and talk to Ronald and hash all of this out. She's so brave, so brave. Greg was getting really excited at this point. This was the most he'd gotten from Dee Dee in months, but he played it cool and he encouraged her to talk to drug dealer Ronald and even bribe him with money if she had to. They were doing a big drug deal and Ronald kept turning over his money. I think Ronald killed him for the money Abraham had on You call Ronald. <laughs> you tell this <laughs> this is him. We finna get you out of this <laughs> We need to know where this <laughs> at and if you done did it. As they were absorbed in this riveting conversation, undercover detective Mike Smith pulled up in a white Yukon and they had to put a pin in it. They'd get back to that one later. Greg opened the passenger door of Mike Smith's Yukon for Dee Dee and told Mike that Dee Dee was his baby and that he expected his cousin to take care of her because she was afraid he was going to set her up. Dee Dee, back on her game, began vomiting out disingenuous compliments to the silent Mike Smith in the driver's seat that he was about to be legendary and the topic of one of her books. He was probably even going to be asked to be on the Oprah show. The Oprah show. Legendary. This situation has gotten big. I'm in over my head. Oh, we can do this, but I'm gonna need a body. Why would you do that though for me? I'm going anyhow. So I'm going do, anyhow. If you do this, you're gonna be a uh, very popular person. You're gonna, you're gonna be a legend. Now, in order to really illustrate to you how bananas this woman is, I'm going to read to you directly from a book that I, I did read in order to prepare for this case. It's called Unlucky Number by Deborah Mathis and Greg Smith himself. It's an extremely well-written book, and since every conversation was recorded by police at this point, I believe they used actual transcripts of these recordings when writing the book. So here's exactly what Dee Dee said to the undercover agent, Mike Smith. And when she refers to Tori, she's talking about Centoria Butler, Abraham's ex-girlfriend and the mother of his second son, Jeremiah. Dee Dee said, quote, so what happened was Tori was trying to get the last of what he had and what he had left. And he didn't want Tori to have it be for child support because he feels like she had that baby in vain. Well, since he transferred me that, these cops are trying to frame me for killing Abraham. I really didn't kill the man, but he was dealing with some really big, big time drug dealers that told him the cash that I gave him to buy the assets, that they would take it and triple it three times. And they told him, if you can bring us your case, we'll triple it three times. So Abraham said he was gonna go and let them triple it three times. I feel like if Abraham was okay, he would contact me by now because he transferred all that stuff into my name and then he was supposed to leave and you know, not come back for a while. But he would have come back. He would have come back for Christmas time and he's not been back. And they're trying to do what they call corpus delecti on me, charging me without a body because he transferred his assets before he left to me. But I really did not have anything to do with it. These, these drug dealers told me that if I ever told the cops any of their names and told them that they were with Abraham that night and all, that they would kill my 14 year old son. They called my son one day on his phone at school to prove to me that they knew his number and the last drug dealers I told the cops about, they went and told the guys that I said they would kill me and the guys came right back to me. So I came and told the cops about it because they freaking are big mouths. They don't care if I die or not. They just want Abraham, end quote, <laughs> end quote. I'm sorry, but she reminds me of Dale from Horrible Bosses when um, they break into uh, Colin Farrell's house who, who plays one of the horrible bosses and he accidentally does some, uh, some coke and then he's in the car after and he's just going like absolutely crazy in the car. That is what she sounds like. So undercover detective Mike Smith finally spoke after clenching his teeth throughout Dee Dee's nonsensical blabber. And he told her that it didn't really make a lot of sense. What did this Ronald guy have to do with it? Was Abraham alive or was he dead? If he was dead, why was Ronald still messing with Dee Dee? Well, Dee Dee had an answer for that too, right? Of course, apparently Ronald was also selling guns and he didn't want the cops sniffing around him because then they would discover his gun dealing business. Once again, Mike Smith was confused. So was Abraham not dead? Was Ronald only worried about the police finding out about his gun business? Mike Smith didn't want to go to the police and confess to killing Abraham if he was just going to show up later and make Mike look like a poser and a liar. And Dee Dee responded, quote, Abraham doesn't want to be found, so I can tell you, if you take the rap, he's not going to show up. He does not want to be found. 
But I guarantee you, Ronald has killed him. I just can't find this effer. If I could find him, I wouldn't be in this situation, end quote. So she's like, Abraham isn't going to come back. He doesn't want to be found. But I'm sure he's dead anyways, so don't worry about it. Finally, Dee Dee said she would try and get a hold of Ronald, and she asked Mike what he wanted in exchange. He told her 50 grand, and she asked him if she could give it to him in increments because she didn't have that much money available at this time. Which is crazy to me, right? Because by the time she'd stolen all of Abraham's money, he had at least a few million left, and she had spent so much of it she didn't even have 50 grand. Mike agreed to take 10 up front as long as Dee Dee promised that she would make sure his family got the rest after the deed was done, after he'd confessed and he'd gone to prison. Dee Dee said she would have to sell one of her houses to get the rest of the money. Now, keep in mind, she's not talking about one of her houses. She's talking about one of the houses of a friend or a family member of Abraham Shakespeare who he had loaned the money to let this person buy their house. And then now the loan was transferred to Dee Dee's name. So she was responsible for the loan. So she could foreclose on one of these houses and then sell it to get the rest of the money for Mike. And then Greg would make sure Mike's wife and son got the money. Mike said, okay, they had a deal, but he would really need the body so that he could take it somewhere and bury it himself correctly. That way he could make a deal with the police to have his sentences run concurrently using the location of Abraham's body as leverage. Once I go ahead and, and confess to this shit, they done with you. Because they definitely gonna want the fucking body. Okay, okay, deal. Dee Dee promised to reach out to drug dealing, gun slinging Ronald and see what she could do. The next steps police told Greg when he reported back to them later was for him to avoid Dee Dee for a little while so they could put her under surveillance and see if she made a move to cover up her tracks in case she started panicking once she realized that she'd pretty much admitted to Greg and Mike that she knew Abraham was dead and that he was probably buried on her property. Oh, and killed with her gun. A few days later, Dave Wallace told Greg he was good to call Dee Dee and push her to reveal the location of Abraham's body. What she needed was a sense of urgency. Greg called her and told her they needed to meet urgently and in person. On January 25th, they rendezvoused in the Lakeland Mall parking lot and Dee Dee got into Greg's car. He told her that he'd been at a buddy's house the night before watching a basketball game and some guys were there who worked for the Hillsborough Sheriff's Office. They had been talking about the case, so he eavesdropped and found out that the police were about to get a search warrant for all of Dee Dee's properties that were located in Plant City. Greg said he had called Mike to let him know about the new developments and Mike had told him to tell Dee Dee it was time to move, now. Remember, just a few days ago, Dee Dee had told Greg and Mike that she had no idea where Abraham was, but now she was able to tell Greg that Abraham was buried nine feet under and she was willing to show him where that night because her boyfriend's mother lived right next to the dig site, but she wouldn't be home that evening because she was going over to Dee Dee's house or Abraham's old house for dinner. Just like I said, the goddamn body is still on that property. We're moving the body, we're moving the body tonight. And in case this admission wasn't enough, Greg decided to pile on the evidence of Dee Dee's guilt, instructing her to go to the store, buy bleach, heavy rope, gloves, and a shovel. He wanted her to park her truck and a trailer right by where the body was buried, leave the supplies behind the house, and get the hell out of there so that she could have an alibi of where she was in case anybody got caught up that night. Dee Dee agreed and said she would have to go and get the gun so she and Greg should meet later that day so she could give it to him. Greg and Mike would go to the place where Abraham was buried when it started to get dark that night, get Mike's prints on the gun, and then Mike would turn himself in. Easy peasy. Later, when she handed over the 38 Smith & Wesson to Greg, Dee Dee casually suggested that maybe Mike and Greg should just take Abraham's body out to a field and burn it. That way no one could ever prove he was actually dead. Greg could see the finish line here, the finish line of when he would be able to not deal with Dee Dee more again. But he still had to play along, even though her suggestion made him sick to his stomach, and he told her, that if that's what she wanted done, she would also need to pick up kerosene along with the rest of the materials. And Dee Dee responded, and maybe some marshmallows. And then she laughed. But then Dee Dee asked Greg to check Abraham's body for money before they burned him. And Greg could really no longer hide his disgust. He told Dee Dee, like, this is where I draw the line. I'm trying to help you here. I'm trying to get you out of trouble, but I'm not going to search the dead body of my friend for money. I don't care if he's got a million dollars on him. 
Dee Dee wasn't taken aback by this, she just shrugged and put the gun in his lap. Right after this, Greg brought the weapon to the police who were listening in nearby. They had the murder weapon, but they still weren't sure of the exact spot Abraham was buried since the property in Plant City that Dee Dee owned was pretty large. And it had two separate houses located on it. The first one that she had bought where she used to live before she stole Abraham's house, and now she used that house as an office. And the second one that she had bought next door to that house where she had had her boyfriend's mother, Patricia, move into. Greg was supposed to meet Dee Dee in Plant City a few hours later, and she was going to show him the exact spot. So the Polk County detectives had to get on the phone with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office since Dee Dee's property was located in that county. And they would need to ask for warrants for both her addresses on State Road 60 East in preparation for when Greg had the spot of Abraham Shakespeare's final resting place. When Greg met Dee Dee, in Plant City on her property, she had all the materials that he had requested. They stood together looking out over the yard next to the house that her boyfriend Shar's mother lived in, and Dee Dee placed an iron rod in the corner of a large concrete slab in the middle of the lawn, telling Greg that this is where they would need to dig later, about six feet down. She said the drug dealers had killed Abraham after getting into a fight in the house next door. Ronald had finally told her everything. He'd even given her a drawing of the concrete slab to show exactly where Abraham's body would be underneath it. Ronald was a very helpful and accommodating drug dealer slash gun runner. With a heavy heart, Greg trudged back to his car with the drawing of the concrete slab and the new knowledge that Abraham was actually gone. Of course, Greg had suspected it, even fully believed it at some point. But to finally know, know that Abraham was dead and buried in the ground, it was a completely different story. Greg met with Wallace and the other detectives, handing them Dee Dee's notebook with the drawing of the concrete slab, and he told them, you know, go get my friend. But Greg had one more performance to pull off before it was all over. As police swarmed Dee Dee's Plant City properties and Dee Dee was throwing a dinner party, it was Greg's job to get her out of the house so that when the police came to take her away, it wouldn't be traumatic to her 14-year-old son. Greg called her from his car and when she answered, he accused her of trying to set him up telling her that when he and Mike had arrived to get the body, there was cops everywhere with bright lights and digging equipment. He told her to leave her house immediately and come meet him. And then Dee Dee's like, well, I have people over for dinner. This woman is unbelievable. Greg says to her, like, listen, lady, none of that matters. I don't care if your spaghetti is too al dente or if the sauce didn't simmer for long enough. The cops are about to find out that Abraham is dead and he's buried on your property. You think your little family dinner is priority right now? Like, get a grip. Dee Dee agreed to meet with him in the mall parking lot 20 minutes later, but she hadn't been parked there for two minutes before David Wallace and his partner, David Clark, the guy Dee Dee had tried to get to a motel with her, pulled up and told Greg and Dee Dee that they were requested down at the station. They didn't put them under arrest, really. You know, they didn't like handcuff them and put them in the car. They let them drive to the sheriff's office separately in their own vehicles. But I mean, it was pretty obvious why they wanted them there. I know there are some of you out there who might feel badly for Dee Dee. You'll say that she's clearly unstable. Maybe something happened to her after that 2005 car accident that completely removed her common sense and humanity. She seemed truly grateful to Greg for helping her out. She would always tell him how thankful she was to have him and, and say she was surprised that he was being so nice to her. And then she put her trust in him and he betrayed her. I personally, like I said, don't feel an ounce of sympathy for her, but I know some of you might, but you shouldn't spend too much time crying for Dee Dee Moore. The second she got into that interrogation room, she turned on my boy, Greg Smith. Dee Dee acted super happy when the detectives walked into the room and she said, you got him, the guy who killed Abraham. And they're like, what are you talking about? And she's like, that guy that was with me, Greg, he killed Abraham. So imagine her surprise when the police just as happily informed her that they knew Greg hadn't killed Abraham because Greg had been working with them for months to set her up. They had it all. They had all her incriminating BS on tape. They had the murder weapon. They had the location of Abraham's body, courtesy of Greg Smith's Red Bull Super Spy Gadget. But do you think Dee Dee Moore would say to herself, well, they've got me. I might as well just admit it and end this. No, nope. Mm -mm. She told the police that it was the drug dealers. It had been a warm spring day in early April of 2009 when Abraham, Ronald, and two other drug dealers that she didn't know had arrived at her house at 5732 State Road 60. At this time, Dee Dee was managing Abraham's money as he'd asked her to. So he'd have to ask her if he wanted some of his money. And on this day, he did. He wanted $200,000 
to give to the drug dealers. Dee Dee had tried to talk him out of it, and they began to argue. Before she knew it, one of the men Abraham had brought with him grabbed her gun out of the open gun safe and shot Abraham. Because it makes complete sense to shoot the person who you want $200,000 from and who wants to give you $200,000 and not shoot the woman who is standing in the way of you getting that money. Now when the detectives pointed out to Dee Dee that they had her on tape inventing this Ronald character, she simply responded that she had not killed Abraham. She couldn't tell them who had because she'd just found out the day before, but she'd written the name down on a slip of paper and it was at home. It was a drug deal that went bad and the guy's name is, uh, uh, I, I just found it out. Now, David Clark and David Wallace knew that Dee Dee Moore was their real killer, but they were still waiting on the warrants from the Hillsborough County to search her properties. They had police there securing the scene. They had the equipment ready to dig and, and do their worst, but they couldn't do anything until they had those warrants, including placing her under arrest. They'd been hoping for a confession. Obviously, they'd been hoping that she would just say, yeah, I did it, or give them something, but they just have to settle for getting Abraham's body and building their case against this woman who lied so frequently, she probably didn't even remember her own lies. She certainly didn't remember how to tell the truth. Dee Dee Moore went home that night with strict instructions to not leave town, that she would be hearing from the police very soon. The next morning was January 26th, 2010, and the warrants had finally come through. Investigators, excavators, and forensic teams descended on the property to collect every bit of evidence they could find and to start digging. The actual digging would be done over the course of the next three days, but finally they found him under that slab of concrete that had just been poured a year prior. Abraham's body was dressed in a black jacket, a light-colored shirt, jeans, black belt, and black socks. He was not wearing shoes. All the metal parts of his clothes, like zippers and buckles and buttons, had been cut off, most likely so that a metal detector would not find him under there. The medical examiner recovered two bullets, one that had entered the right upper chest, the second that had entered through the lower right chest, perforating his lung. Abraham's mother released a statement to the press saying, the past few months have been filled with uncertainty and worry over the fate and whereabouts of my son. We had certainly hoped for a different outcome. They didn't care anything for him. All they wanted was his money. He was hounding every day about money. He couldn't even, his phone just constantly rang it. His life was miserable. I think that it was others involved, but I think Didi, the people that she had to do things for her, you know, these people just came right in and did what she wanted them to do, you know, for, for a little money. I think she had something to do with it. Well, one, we was talking one, one day, I was with her in her car, and she was talking about, we was talking something about him, and she said, when he died, I just looked at her real strange and, you know, and she said, oh, uh, and she switched and started talking about something else. Yeah, I feel angry. But one time, how, how I missed him, he wasn't there for my, I mean, for Thanksgiving or Christmas, and I was just looking for him to just maybe just drive up <laughs> any day. But after I see that that didn't happen, it put a, a, a deep grief on my heart a deep longing and loneliness missing my son. And think about that, I'd never see him again. When Dee Dee heard the news, she jumped on the phone to tell Detective Wallace that she was ready to tell the truth. Her new truth was that Abraham's own cousin, Cedric, had shot him. But I'm telling you, Cedric took the gun and in cold blood did not even hesitate to shoot the man. And I've seen it happen. She'd seen it. She'd been in the room when it happened. But wait, actually, maybe that isn't what happened. When Abraham came over that day in April and he and Dee Dee had argued, he had actually tried to kill her when she wouldn't give him the money. He went at her and wrapped his hands around her throat. And she saw it in his eyes, the anger, the savagery, the intent to end her life. And then someone shot him out of the blue, but she didn't see who. Maybe one of the drug dealers that he'd brought with him. Maybe she had shot him herself, but she had been blacking out from being choked, so she just couldn't remember. But wait, I'm not finished. Her story changed again right after this. She told the police that her own 14-year-old son, RJ, 
had shot Abraham in an effort to save his mother's life. She said, my son RJ shot Abraham twice. Abraham was trying to choke me. RJ walked in the room, grabbed my gun and shot him. He was only protecting me like any son would do. So keep in mind, these three versions of Dee Dee's story did not evolve over the course of a few days or a few weeks. She shot these all out in one sitting, one single interview with the police. And what kind of mother points the finger at her own child and tries to frame him for a murder that she committed? It's gross, and the police thought so too. They pretty much told Dee Dee to get out of their sight so that they could bring in her son RJ and question him, something that they had not wanted to do that they had been trying to avoid doing, bringing RJ into the situation. But Dee Dee had made it impossible to protect and shield her son from this investigation any longer. And of course, RJ did not shoot Abraham. He told the police he had only ever met the man twice in his life. And when RJ asked if he had seen Abraham choking his mother and then shot him, RJ responded that this 100% did not happen. The next day, Dee Dee began texting Dave Wallace again. These police officers are trying to build a case against her, get the evidence, examine it. You know, they're working day and night trying to bring this woman to justice, and she will just not leave them alone. She came back into the station with a completely different story. This time, Abraham had come to her office asking for money, but the drug dealers were two white guys she didn't know, and the person who had shot Abraham was Dee Dee's lawyer, Howard Stitzel. <laughs> so here's what I think Dee Dee was thinking. The more stories she could make up, the more wild goose chases she could send the cops on, the less time and focus and energy they'd have to pursue the lead of her being the killer. Because every time she gave them the name of somebody who shot Abraham, her son, her lawyer, Ronald, these other drug dealers, Cedric, every time she gave them a new name, they obviously have to follow up on the lead. They can't just say, well, we're not going to look into that because we think you did it. They have to follow up on that lead. So that takes them off the path of going towards her and finding out more about her and onto different random paths. The detectives felt that this is what Dee Dee was doing as well, and they kept badgering her to just tell them the truth. And she kept insisting that she couldn't tell them the truth, but they knew why she couldn't tell them. And they also knew that she didn't kill Abraham. Gaslighting at its finest, ladies and gentlemen. If there was an award for the most extra attempt of gaslighting in the past 50 years, maybe the past 100 years, it would go to Dee Dee Moore. The police went to pay a visit to Patrick Donegan, Dee Dee's father, on January 30th. He and his wife had just seen Dee Dee the night before when they'd brought her some food. And Patrick claimed his daughter had spent most of the time complaining about her current situation how the cops were breathing down her neck and she hadn't done anything and how the cops were now trying to blame this whole thing on her son, RJ. And as a good father does, Patrick told Dee Dee that he wished he could take it all away from her. You know, when your kid gets the flu and they're sick and you feel bad, you wish you could just be the one with the flu instead so you could take the sickness and they don't have to deal with it. But apparently, Dee Dee had taken him literally and she asked him, would you really do something like that, Dad? And Donegan told investigators Dee Dee asked for his help. Quote, she said, well, you're old, you're getting old, and all this stuff. The investigator asked, okay, so basically she was just asking if you would take her place in all this? Donegan replied, basically. Additionally, the police discovered that Dee Dee had been hiding the murder weapon at her parents' home. Dee Dee had also brought over a plethora of expensive personal possessions, like jewelry and cameras, telling her parents that she wanted to keep them safe from the drug dealers. And to add the cherry on top of Dee Dee's selfish little ice cream sundae, she had not only gotten herself fired from Arcadia Medical after embezzling money from them, she'd also gotten her mother fired from the same place by implicating her in that embezzlement scheme. It's very hard for me to understand how Dee Dee Moore was still walking free when pretty much everyone with even one brain cell knew that she had stolen Abraham's money and then killed him. It was something she was used to, I guess, doing illegal things, stealing, lying, hurting people, even if those people were related by blood to her. She may have felt like this would be another one of those times that this would all blow over, that they wouldn't have enough evidence to charge her. The woman was still living in Abraham's house, for God's sake. She had gotten a lawyer who told her to stop talking to the police. They had the gun, the body, the recordings, but she still wasn't in custody. And when January turned into February, Dee Dee Moore most likely felt that she would escape from this as well. But that was not to be. 
And that is where we will end part two of this case. In part three, we'll cover her inevitable arrest, the three-ring circus that her trial becomes because she's part of it. So, of course, it's going to become a circus. We'll also get a better look at what evidence the police had, what evidence they would come to find, and how many other people she had involved in her nefarious deeds. So hopefully you will join me for the conclusion of how Abraham Shakespeare went from the luckiest man in Florida to the unfortunate victim of a sociopath named Dee Dee Moore. Do rice more if you're nasty. Thank you so much for joining me for this video. Remember to follow me on Instagram and Twitter if you haven't yet. Remember to subscribe if you haven't yet. If you have subscribed, make sure you check and make sure you still are subscribed because YouTube likes to unsubscribe people from my channel and they really like to not notify people when I post videos. So just make sure that you're subscribed and that notifications are turned on. Also, don't forget to check out June's Journey in the description box. Download the game for free. Start playing, start relaxing, start having fun, start challenging your mind. Thank you so much to my Patreons who keep me going every single day. They do get to see the videos before anybody else does, so they give me feedback when I really need it because I'm always nervous before I post a video every single time. I've been doing this for a few years and I still get nervous every time I post a video uh, about what the reaction is going to be like. So having them see it and then let me know what they think, it gives me a little like peace of mind, I guess, before I post the video. Thank you so much for joining me. I will see you very, very soon. Stay kind. Stay beautiful. Bye. Straight down And that river runs deep The mountains get steep And the voices getting too loud All these feelings out of baby It's looking like a cemetery They're going back from the grave Calling out my name Better say I have Mary But you don't know How deep it goes Until it's getting you slowly And so you got